Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing on challenges to religious freedom in Sri Lanka. Thank you to our distinguished witnesses for taking the time to join us today. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USER, is an independent bipartisan U.S. government advisory body created by the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act, or IRFA. The commission uses international standards to monitor freedom of religion or belief abroad and makes policy recommendations to the U.S. government. Today, USERF exercises its statutory authority under IRFA to convene this important hearing. This month marks the 15th anniversary of the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War and therefore an appropriate time to discuss current religious freedom challenges and opportunities in Sri Lanka. While not a religious conflict, the decades-long civil, civil war included central religious divisions between the predominantly Buddhist Sinhalese majority and the primarily Hindu and Christian Tamil minorities. Sri Lanka's Muslim population was equally affected with large-scale displacement in the northern part of the country. 15 years after the war's conclusion, Sri Lanka continues to reconcile with its history of ethnic and religious violence. In 2023, and most recently in our 2024 annual report released last week, USERF recommended that the US Department of State place Sri Lanka on its special watch list for engaging in or tolerating severe religious freedom violations. In the years following the Civil War's conclusion, discrimination against religious minorities, particularly Tamil Christians, Tamil Hindus, and Muslims, have exacerbated religious tensions. In the aftermath of attacks like the 2019 Easter Sunday bombings, the Sri Lankan government has used laws to disproportionately target and silence religious minority communities under the guise of national security and curbing the insult to religion. Simultaneously, the Sri Lankan government has used constitutional provisions to target religious minorities' places of worship, which our witnesses will discuss in greater detail. I now will turn the floor over to Commissioner David Curry for his opening remarks. Commissioner Curry. Thank you, Vice Chair Davey, and thank you to all those here to testify. I would like to join in welcoming everyone to the hearing and to thank our witnesses for taking the time and to offer your expertise. It's much appreciated. I had the opportunity along with Commissioner Schneck and some of our key staff to visit Sri Lanka for the first time this past October. It was truly a amazing experience to travel throughout the country, including the North and East to meet with religious communities and leaders from all faiths, journalists, government officials as well. During our delegation, we also had the opportunity to visit one of the three hotels that was struck during the bombing in 2019 during the Easter season, where religious minorities were largely targeted during their Sunday services. In total, three churches, three hotels were attacked and over 260 people died. Following these deadly attacks, Authorities used the Problematic Prevention of Terrorism Act, or PTA, to arbitrarily detain hundreds of Muslim men and women. It was enacted as a temporary measure in 1979, and the PTA continues to be used by Sri Lankan authorities to arrest, search, and detain individuals. While designed to curb terrorism concerns, the PTA's broad and vague language, that's key here, has been used with increasing frequency to target religious minorities and human rights advocates, including one of the witnesses that is testifying today, which I very much look forward to hearing. In recent years, authorities have utilized the PTA in combination with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights Act, or ICCPR Act, to crack down on religious minorities. While designated to protect religion from insult, the ICCPR Act has been largely used as a blasphemy law to silence religious minorities and curtail freedom of thought. 
In 2022, for example, Sri Lankans came together to protest economic conditions in the country. Authorities used both the PTA and the ICCPR to arbitrarily arrest several Catholic priests and Buddhist monks who vocalized their disapproval with the government. Sri Lankan authorities have also used these discriminatory laws, discriminatory laws to detain comedians, poets, lawyers, and activists. USURF remains particularly concerned that the proposed amendments to the PTA, the newly proposed Anti-Terrorism Act, and the newly proposed Online Safety Bill will exacerbate these types of arrest. We're also concerned about the targeting of places of worship. During our time in Sri Lanka, we spoke with members of the Christian community who described increasing harassment and challenges in registering churches at the local level, despite no requirement by the national government. Recent announcements by the Ministry of Buddha Hasana, Religious and Cultural Affairs, that authorities will raid unregistered, air quotes around that, places of worship is especially of concern and an issue that USURF will continue to track. At this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Commissioner Schneck. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Commissioner Curry. And welcome everybody. It's, it's good to see some familiar faces here uh, today as well. I wanted to take a moment to discuss some observations that Commissioner Curry and I noted uh, during our delegation to Sri, Sri Lanka last October uh, that he mentioned. In 2023, USURF conducted a delegation to Sri Lanka. Commissioners and staff had the opportunity, opportunity to raise several of the concerns mentioned by Vice Chair Davey and Commissioner Curry, including uh, the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the ICCPR Act. We also met with a number of different religious communities in Colombo, Trikamali, and Jaffna, and were encouraged there by several interfaith efforts at the local level. In Trikamali, for example, our delegation was greeted by members of the Catholic Church, as well as members of the Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim communities there to discuss interfaith efforts, including supporting the public celebration of different religious holidays. We were also grateful for the opportunity to visit several religious sites, including Hindu temples, churches, and mosques. In recent years, however, there have been increasing incidents of land disputes involving tensions between Buddhist heritage conservation and sites that religious minorities claim as their own. This came up in several discussions throughout our Sri Lanka visit. Different communities that we met with explained how Sri Lanka's Buddhist Asana uh, Department of uh, Archaeology, I'm sorry, how, how Sri Lanka's Department of Archaeology, which operates under the Ministry of Buddhist Asana, uh, Religious and Cultural Affairs, has worked in collaboration with Buddhist monks and local authorities to identify and preserve cultural sites throughout the country. In some cases, this has led to the expropriation of Hindu and Muslim places of worship, which our witnesses will discuss in more detail with you today. Thank you all very much. Appreciate the witnesses being here today, and I'll turn the floor over to Vice Chair Davy. Vice Chair Davy. Thank you, Commissioner Schneck. I'd now like to briefly introduce our witnesses. Each person's full biography can be found on our website at www.usurf.gov. First, we will hear from Hijaz Hezbollah, who is a human rights lawyer known for his advocacy on behalf of Sri Lankan's Muslim community that has been affected by hate speech and discrimination. As Commissioner Curry mentioned, he, has, uh, he was targeted and formally detained as a result of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, or PTA. Our next witness will be Madura Ras Rasaratman, um, who is the interim executive director of the People for Equality and Relief in, um, in Sri Lanka, or Pearl. Uh, Dr. Razar Atnam uh, is also associate professor of comparative politics at City, uh, uh, comparative politics at City 
University of London. Her research examines ethnic and nationalist conflict with a regional focus on South Asia. She will be followed by Michael by Mike uh, Gabriel, the head of religious of Religious Liberty Commission at the National Christian Evangelical Alliance of Sri Lanka. Our fourth our fourth witness is Shreen Abdul Sarur, uh, who is a co-founder of the Women's Action Network. Through this group, she is creating a new generation of young women leaders from divergent groups who don't typically work together, such as Muslim, Tamil, and Sinhalese, to ramp up the women's movement in Sri Lanka. And our final witness is Alan Keenan, who is the International Crisis Group's senior consultant on Sri Lanka. He has lived and worked in Sri Lanka for extended periods and holds a PhD in political theory. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Mr. Hezbollah, you may begin your testimony. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate on this webinar hosted by the US Commission on International Religious Freedom on the challenges to religious freedom in Sri Lanka. On March 28, 2024, the High Court of Colombo sentenced Galagodate Nyanasar Tera to four years rigorous imprisonment for Islamic for insulting Islam uh, for a statement made by him in 2016. Nyanasar Tera was the poster boy, literally and metaphorically, of the Bodhubala Sena, a very hardline extremist Singhala Buddhist group. And in fact, it was Nyanasar Tera's statements and work. Uh, that uh, motivated me to commence my work as a Muslim rights ad advocate in 2012 in my capacity as an attorney at law. Whilst the conviction of Jana Sadatero is in many ways an unprecedented event and might be seen by some as, as, as a victory for religious belief, in fact, this is not the case. And the very prosecution and conviction of Jana Saratero demonstrates some of the more deeply problematic issues that Sri Lanka faces in terms of religious belief and religious freedom and the use of the law, especially laws such as the PTA and the ICCPR. First and foremost, Jana Saratero was prosecuted not under the PTA or under the ICCPR, but under the penal code uh, sections 291, which are uh, very old blasphemy laws. So the, it's the, in the very selection of the law uh, to prosecute Nana Saratero, and in the particular offense or incident that he was selected for prosecution, there is, it's, it's, it is problematic because uh, he was selected for something Whereas there were instances, there are many instances of actual violence being incited by Nana Saltero for which he was not prosecuted for, where there was actual violations of religious belief and religious freedom by Nana Saltero for which he was not he, he was not prosecuted. One such example was the incident in 2012 where the attack on the Dambulla Mosque, where on a Friday a large group, a, a large group of Buddhist monks walked into the Dambulla Mosque and uh, prevented congregation prayers and wanted the mosque to be removed. Similar such incidents have occurred uh, in, in uh, Molawatha Lane in Kalambo 12, where mosque, the mosque was set on fire. Now, on those incidences, there has been no prosecution of anybody. And, and the prosecution also highlights the, the, the stark reality or the stark distinction between the way the law is weaponized against minority communities. For example, as has been noted already, uh, the PTA and the ICCPR are being used repeatedly targeting minority uh, community members for prosecutions. Uh, I have two examples. One is the case of uh, Ahnaf Jazim, a poet, and Ramzi Razik, both of whom were arrested under the PTA and ICCPR respectively. And Ahnaf Jazim spent almost two years in custody. 
uh, the facts, Ahanaf spent two years in custody and of course he was uh, acquitted and he was discharged from high court proceedings. Now, the charges for which Ahanaf was prosecuted for do not in any way come near to what Jana Salatera is, uh, uh, is, is against whom evident, uh, if strong evidential uh, material is available for. So this is where the religious freedom issues really crop up in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has also enacted uh, recently, the not enacted, but has uh, lined up for inaction, uh, enactment, the Anti-Terrorism Act, and also recently enacted the Online Safety Act, which all have the potential to seriously curb the freedom of expression and also have the potential to be used uh, and to be abused to target selected group of persons, which will very unlike, very likely be minority community uh, speakers and uh, minority community members who speak on behalf of those communities. Also on the question of religious freedom, we also see uh, the case of what happened after the, in the aftermath of the Easter Sunday attacks, where Muslims faced severe restrictions on religious freedom. A mosque in Mahara was closed down. Muslim women faced restrictions on their attire. School girls had problems going to school in Islamic attire. Restrictions were placed on the importing of Islamic books and copies of the Quran, and even Islamic TV channels are, have been banned. These restrictions have not been entirely removed, although the public discussion based on the investigations in the after, with regard to Easter Sunday refute the original assertion that widespread radicalization of Muslims was the cause of the attack, the community still remains treated as a radicalized community um, and, 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 and in a suspicious manner. The, also, the issue about the failure of the law to apply equally to communities is also seen in, in, in the case of the forced cremation of Muslim COVID-19 uh, victims. Uh, despite the existence of clear scientific evidence that the burial of COVID-19 victim does not lead to a uh, uh, spreading of the virus, Muslim COVID-19 victims were forcefully cremated. After intense local and international outcry, Muslims were allowed to bury the dead, but only in selected burial grounds in the, in the Muslim town of Otamavadi. The issue became too hot to ignore, and thereafter the government admitted that it had made a mistake and yet, to date, no one has faced any consequences for their actions. The experts whose opinions were the basis on which the forced cremation uh, took place remain in their positions and even getting promotions. There are zero consequences. So a key challenge to religious freedom in Sri Lanka is a the weaponization of laws against minority communities, the non-application of laws for those who commit freedom of religion, religion violations against minority communities, and also the sense of there is no acceptance within the state or government with regard to the need to guarantee religious freedom for minority communities. And this is particularly in the case of educational opportunities. Uh, yesterday, uh, Muslims, uh, 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 Sri Lanka started its uh, GCE O-level, ordinary level examinations, where girls who, uh, were, were, who girls were attending uh, the uh, examinations in their hijab. Uh, of course, I do not have any uh, reports of uh, girls being prevented from attending uh, the exam uh, in their hijab, but of course this is a usual and ordinary and uh, occurrence. And every year we have cases where girls are prevented from attending, uh, participating at the examinations, atten attending hijab, and this is a problem. So there is a culture, there is no culture of acceptance of the rights of minority communities to practice their religion. And finally, to conclude. Uh, as has been already noted, the key problem with regard to Sri Lanka is the fact that uh, it's not really a religious conflict as such, uh, because 
whilst the country is divided really on religious lines, the country is also divided on ethnic lines as well. And there is a convergence of those ethnic divisions along with religious lines. So you are identified as a Sinhala Buddhist or a Tamil Hindu or a Tamil Christian. And this can be clearly seen in the Mulletivu Kurundur Malay incident, where there is a refusal to accept uh, the existence of a group of Tamil Buddhists uh, who uh, who might have might have existed and practiced. So these are my preliminary thoughts on uh, the issue of religious freedom in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hispilar. And we will now turn the floor over to Ms. Raza Atnam uh, for her comments. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and to share my uh, thoughts. Um, let me just put the timer on. I don't do the typical academic thing of just talking too much. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you everyone. And um, thank you for this opportunity. So as Vice Chair Davy mentioned, this is the 15th anniversary of the end of the war. Um, and that's kind of a critical event in Sri Lanka's history. So I just want to say a bit about that. And some of the issues that we see in relation to religious freedom in Sri Lanka, because the fundamental factors that drove the war remain unresolved and the kind of the, the sort of cataclysm of violence that marked the end of the war also remain unresolved. So just to sort of foreground the, the sort of the scale of what the end of the war meant, between January and May 2009, subsequent UN reports estimate that between 40 and 70,000 Tamil civilians were killed in an area known as the Bani. Um, Indiscriminate bombing, starvation, and humanitarian blockade marked the end of the war. Uh, the late Bishop of Manna, Rayapu Joseph, um, has said that 142,000 people remain unaccounted for as a result of that violence. Now, that kind of context has not been addressed and has not been resolved. And what it has done is it has expanded. So there's uh, Commissioner Curry mentioned the PTA. Uh, which was brought in as a temporary measure and was intended to be used primarily against Tamil um, separatists, has now been expanded in scope and is being used to police uh, dissent of all kinds. So the kind of the context of religious freedom is part of the context of the war. And why we see this continuation of problems is because the drivers of the conflict itself and the events that took place at the end of the war, none of those things have been resolved. So my kind of key point is that one of the ways that I would understand it as a comparativist, as a comparative political scientist, is to think of Sri Lanka as a kind of religious and militarized ethnocracy. Um, so on the one hand, in the constitution, it does guarantee freedom of uh, belief, freedom of association. But on the other hand, the constitution also uh, you know, direct the state and agencies of the state to protect and foster Buddhism. And it's the effect of these agencies of the state, particularly powerful, really powerful agencies, overwhelming agencies now, like the military um, and the secu security forces, and more broadly, to kind of ensure the supremacy of um, Sinhala Buddhism uh, as the kind of the dominant group that drove the conflict in the first place and that continued to drive uh, these tensions that we're seeing. Um, so, and it takes different forms. So, um, as previous, um, uh, um, as uh, Hijab has, Hijaz has Bula mentioned, in the North and East, you can see this in uh, terms of ongoing effects like, or, or effects of signalization or Buddhization. Um, the illustrative example that was uh, previously mentioned is the Adiyayan Temple in Kulun Mala Hill. Um, where and here the repertoire is instructive. The repertoire of dispossession is quite instructive. So this is has been customarily in the recent past at least and longer a site of Hindu worship. Uh, but in 2018, it was kind of invaded by a group of similar Buddhist activists and monks who started constructing a Buddhist temple. When the Tamils resisted and they took the issue to the local magistrate's court, the local magistrate issued an order to sort of stop the construction of the Buddhist temple. Then what happened is a government minister, along with the security forces, along with the activists, came back to the site and forcibly built a temple, Buddhist, Buddhist temple, 
Um, and the, the, the people who had previously worshipped there, the, the Tamil Hindus, were no longer allowed access to the site. And a Buddhist monk has also started cultivating the fields around that area. The Tamil magistrate then, who issued the interim stay order, was also then forced to flee the island in September 2023 20, because of threats to his life. So you can see that whatever the constitution may contain, how things work out in practice, are um, you know um, uh, very much kind of shaped by this reality of you know what I would call um, uh, religious and militarized um, ethnocracy. That's the way the state functions, and this is not primarily just in that site, one site alone. There are others um, uh, uh, similar where similar tactics are ongoing at the present moment. There's a place called Kayad in Jaffna uh, in Batiklo. Um, yeah, in Mayaratu uh, Madhu, in uh, Nira Viday, in Mundakibu, and the Parali Murun Temple in uh, Jaffna also is kind of similar thing has started. Um, that last temple I'm actually very familiar with and visited several times um, as a child. Um, so that's kind of how it works in the Northeast. And then you also have this atmosphere of majoritarian entitlement um, and threats that has since particularly since the end of the war that has expanded to target um, Muslims and Christians that has that has been detailed um, by that, and that will be detailed by the the, um, the other um, experts who are here today um, and so I, ca I kind of want to draw your attention to the the final thing which I think speaks to the extent to which this is really something very institutional and deep within the state and something that should be a cause for concern um, and something that should be addressed with some urgency. So um, and, and another kind of important religious figure in uh, Sri Lanka, Cardinal Malcolm Manjit, has you know, recently made some very kind of candid and deeply disquieting accusations against um, Sri Lankan um, political and military leaders. He's called for an international investigation into the um, 2019 Easter Sunday attacks, and he's made some extremely disquieting allegations saying that, you know, there was security forces and senior political collusion with those attacks, and these attacks were an attempt, a false flag attempt, to secure the presidential victory of Gopal Rajapaksa. Um, these allegations have been supported by um, a documentary, BBC, um, not BBC, sorry, Channel 4 documentary, British documentary uh, that was aired on August 2020, in August 2023, in which a whistle, whistleblower alleged that senior politicians and um, security force officials had close contacts with the militants who carried out the attacks extremely disquieting attacks, uh, allegations, but if you're familiar with the way in which the war was conducted, with the use of paramilitaries, uh, the use of disappearances, um, the security forces, you know, having dark sites and operating across, sorry, uh, operating across the island, these accusations are not particularly surprising, but what we see is that because that, that context of the war, the factors that drove the war, the outcomes, of none of that has been addressed. It just perpetuates and carries on and expands and expands and expands and has repercussions beyond the North and East and beyond the um, tunnels. Um, and so what these accusations suggest is that powerful single leaders are really willing to use deadly false flag attacks to incite religious violence as a means of advancing this ethno-nationalist agenda, which is, um, you know, um, protecting and fostering a particular type of state uh, that has, that, you know, is the sort of the, the driver of uh, the conflict itself and the driver of many of the, 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 the events that are being discussed on, on this panel today. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. We're now going to uh, turn the floor over to Mr. Gabriel, Mr. Gabriel. Uh, Vice Chair, members of the commission, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding religious freedom challenges faced by the Christian community in Sri Lanka. Uh, my name is Mike Gabriel, and I'm representing the National Christian Evangelical Alliance, or NCSL, as it's commonly known. Uh, the NCSL, with a history of more than 70 years, is the largest representative body for evangelical Christians in the country. Uh, now, with regard to religious demographics, the Christian community in Sri Lanka comprise Roman Catholics, who make up 6.2% of the population and Protestant Christians who are approximately 1.4% of the population. And as noted by Dr. Asaratnam, constitutionally, 
Buddhism holds a privileged position under Article 9 with the state uh, tasked to protect and foster the Buddha Sasana while guaranteeing religious freedom to all citizens under Article 10 and Article 14.1e of the Constitution. Uh, but saying that, state policy and practice uh, have historically been majoritarian in nature, and this has resulted in systemic discrimination against ethno-religious minorities in Sri Lanka. Now, since the end of the Civil War in 2009, NCSL has documented several incidents of discrimination, intimidation, and violence, uh, which actually highlights the entrenched and chronic nature of religious freedom violations against Christians in the country. Uh, furthermore, perpetrators of such violence, as Hijaz also noted, often evade justice, and as seen in the case of these Sunday attacks in 2009, uh, five years on, despite numerous committees and commissions of inquiry appointed by the government, the truth behind the attacks and the extent of the conspiracy uh, still remains uh, shrouded in ambiguity. Uh, now, with regard to impediments of religious freedom, administrative restrictions imposed by the state, such as the circular 2022 issued by the Minister of Buddhist Asana and Religious Affairs, have particularly posed significant challenges to the religious freedom of Christian communities. Uh, the circular, in extremely broad language, mandates the registration of new places of worship, effectively requiring state approval for Christian religious activities. We believe this undermines constitutional guarantees for religious freedom and non-discrimination in Articles 10, Articles 12, and Articles 14.1e of the Constitution. And uh, more recent analysis of incidents concerning demands for registration of churches indicates that actually registration is frequently exploited by the authorities as an intimidation tactic and a pretext to disrupt Christian worship activity in specific areas. Churches are so often demanded by authorities to register or discontinue their worship activities. And in some instances, we've also seen the authorities hinder churches with parliamentary incorporation, a higher form of registration from carrying out religious worship services. And also in a recent development, the Department of Christian Affairs have now specified plans to legislate a mandatory system to register Christian places of worship in the country. And uh, following this, in a worrying development, and as noted by Commissioner Kari in his comments as well, in March 2024, the Minister of Buddhist Asana, Religious and Cultural Affairs announced that steps will be taken to raid unregistered religious centers involved in religious conversions. And also, Christian churches, especially in rural areas, are regularly visited by law enforcement officials, including members of the intelligence apparatus who question churches about their activities, including their membership and finances, as part of what church deem a culture of surveillance on religious or minority places of worship in the country. And now with regard to the use of the law to curb religious freedoms and particularly free religious expression in the past year, and he just spoke about this quite a bit, we witnessed a series of arrests, which included a Christian pastor under Sri Lanka's notorious ICCPR Act on allegations of insulting religions. While all those arrested are currently out on bail, the continued weaponization of laws such as the ICCPR Act has been a cause for concern, especially in a context where the government has now passed an online safety act, which is likely to serve as another legal tool at the government's disposal to suppress free expression online. And apart from this, sporadically, Christian parents also face discrimination when seeking admission for their children to public schools, with some schools disregarding legal obligations to admit Christian students in keeping with legislation such as the Assisted Schools and Training Schools Act. And uh, despite occasional judicial intervention, these violations persist and it underscores the complicity of public officials in religious freedom violations in the country. So I think in conclusion, it's important that the Sri Lankan government is urged to firstly uh, pursue a clear, transparent, streamlined and voluntary registration process for places of worship that allows Christian churches the option to seek legal personality for various operational and functional purposes. Secondly, I think it's important to urge them to publish the complete findings of previous inquiries into the Sunday bombings and to establish an independent investigation into the attacks while also arresting the prevailing culture of impunity concerning violations of religious freedom. And finally, I think it's also important towards the government to support initiatives to build religious freedom literacy among state officials with a specific emphasis on law enforcement and subnational state actors. And I will stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now we will turn the floor to Ms. Soror. Ms. Soror, your comments, please. Good morning, Vice Chair and the Commissioners, and warm greetings to my colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Today, my testimony will focus on freedom of religion or belief and Muslim women's rights activists struggle in Sri Lanka. 
piety within religion is often visibly expressed through women's get sorry women's um gatherings and rituals with their bodies clothing and through control of women's reproductive ability all play a central role in shaping the politics of religious identity particularly the post war context and the post easter attack sri lanka in the eastern province where i am sitting there have been allegation against muslims of abducting young tamil girls to marry them fueling tension between tamil and muslim minority community and leading to ostracization of couples who cross community lines in relationship and marriages following the 2019 easter sunday attack muslim women in sri lanka found themselves fighting for their right to wear cultural attire safety in public space mobility and freedom of association they also became targets of the draconian pta that everybody talked about with many working now tirelessly to secure the release of the members detained under this law out of nearly 2000 muslims who have been arrested after the easter attack about 300 men women children were held in detention under pta for long period it was the women who were at the forefront to get them released and are continuing the struggle for the release of remaining 25 men in prolonged detention similarly when the government imposed a racist policy of covid-19 forced cremation it was the women who mounted the campaign against it by petitioning the human rights commission the supreme court and appealing to the international community including the secretariat of the organization of islamic cooperation and the un human rights council despite facing challenges these women have been at the forefront of advocating for their rights and the rights of their community members the muslim marriage and divorce act here after i'll mention as mmda enacted in 1951 in sri lanka has been a point of contention as it codifies customs common among muslims and is administered through a system overseen by a male only qazi the implementation of this law has led to the marginalization and discrimination of muslim women and girls as it legitimizes unconditional polygamy child marriage and teenage pregnancy efforts to reform mmda have been ongoing since 1980s with the recent progress in getting cabinet approval for reforms however some influential but chauvinist individuals within the community are resistant to change spreading falsehood that the remaining uh, sorry reforming of mmda would abolish muslim personal law altogether this resistance stems from cultural not religious sources and reflects a reluctance to empower women and to retain the undue male advantages it is critical to advocate for more inclusive and rational approach to religion and cultural practices that values individual freedom diversity coexistence and tolerance criticism against muslim women rights activists often stem from attempt to discredit or pressure them into abandoning their advocacy effort these activists play a vital role in addressing women's issues within the muslim community and mobilizing for broader community struggle the intersectionality of gender and religion shapes experience of safety and fundamental freedom of, for muslim women highlighting the need for gender sensitive approach to protect and promote their rights state action or inaction can either uphold or permit violation of these rights to persist in response to the increased trend of islamophobia following are the recommendation it is essential to push back against discriminatory practices and policies targeting muslim community in this context reject the government's cynical use of the easter sunday attack to promote unwarranted counter terrorism frameworks that will further prosecute minority communities demand repeal the pta and reject the proposed atb and condemn the use of iccpr act of 2007 to prosecute minority community everybody mentioned this at the same time recognize that fighting islamophobia does not mean renunciation of women's rights recognizing and supporting the demands of muslim women rights activists who have been fighting over 40 years to reform mmda is fundamental call on the government of sri lanka to respect and enforce its obligation under cedo and other human rights instruments thank you very much thank you for your comments as well and we'll now turn to mr keenan Uh, for his comments, Mr. Keen. Thank you very much, 
to the commissioners and the staff for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to be here in this virtual space with um, a lot of people I know and respect. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Um, in my longer written um, presentation, <clears throat> I discussed briefly some of the conflicts in the North and the East um, over temples, um, over sort of holy spaces or holy places that um, Madara mentioned briefly. <clears throat> and in this presentation, I want um, to make some more general points that touch on that and touch on kind of the roots of, or the causes or the factors behind religious violence in Sri Lanka. So with regard to the to the temple disputes in the North and the East, um, I think these need, these need to be seen as part of uh, the, as a delayed effect of a long-term project of rediscovering and protecting Buddhist heritage in the North and the East, initiated by nationalist monks before the end of the war and inaugurated as soon as the Tamil Tigers were forced out of the Eastern province in 2007. The project later received state sanction through a presidential task force established by Gotabia Rajapaksa in 2020. And while that task force has ceased to function, Monks continue to work closely with the archaeology and forest departments and the military and the police to establish Buddhist sites that they claim have been allowed to decay or have been actively destroyed over the past centuries. The ongoing project of re-establishing or establishing, depending on your perspective, Buddhist temples across the North and the East needs to be understood also as part of a long-standing state-backed project to break the contiguity of the territory of the Northeast or North and East seen by Tamil nationalists as a continuous stretch of land that constitutes the Tamil homeland. This project, pose, the, the, the counter project also poses a long-term threat more generally to the Tamil speaking, whether Hindu, Christian, or Muslim character of the Northeast or North and East of the island. The process of claiming land as belonging to Singhala Buddhists is allowed to continue in part because of the lack of clear or consistent action from the president and senior government officials. Their reticence to intervene strongly is likely due to the president's short-term political need to maintain the support of the Buddhist clergy and military, as well as his and others' awareness of the power of the ideological deep structures of Singhala Buddhist nationalism, rooted in religious narratives and fostered by religious institutions, by social separation between groups, by state power, and by political expediency. Any effective response to the current wave of temple building in the North and the East would need to develop a more precise understanding of the extent and sources of support for Buddhist nationalist networks, which include and rely on significant sectors of the military and state bureaucracy, especially the archeology span department, as well as politicians. At a deeper level, advocates of religious freedom and religious pluralism need to develop a better analysis of and responses to the cultural insecurities that help drive Buddhist nationalism. For lasting change, one would need to build a critical mass of monks willing to work within the Buddhist Sangha to develop a different, more accommodating narrative of Buddhism, away from seeing it as perpetually under siege and at risk of disappearing. This is a daunting task. Now, with regard to factors behind, uh, behind interreligious inter violence, um, I'd just like to say that while so far none of Sri Lanka's current sites of religious tension have boiled over into serious violence, the threat of escalation is ever present, particularly in a year that could have multiple highly charged elections. Now, when considering the challenge of preventing interreligious violence in Sri Lanka, there are two basic truths to keep in mind. Now, some of these have been referred in passing by, our, by the previous speakers, but I just wanna bring them out more clearly. First, the pervasive and institutionalized impunity for state violence and crimes is a key factor. The fact that no one in Sri Lanka is ever punished for any ethnic or religious violence or state violence emboldens conflict entrepreneurs, both within the state and outside, and means the threat of violence is ever present. So while things are quiet for now, the fact that no one has been held accountable for any of the waves of violence increases the risks that the anti-Muslim or anti-evangelical project could be reactivated if it seems politically useful to those in or close to power, and also this more recent sort of anti-Hindu project. Now, this brings us to the second basic truth. State backing, or at least tolerance, is always needed for any serious interreligious or inter-ethnic violence in Sri Lanka. This was true in the decades of periodic anti-Tamil rioting and pogroms that began in the 1950s and eventually led to full-scale war in 1983. This has also been true in the almost decade of violent anti-Muslim campaigning. 
Interreligious and interethnic violence are almost never spontaneous local events, but rather need active support from the police and local and often national politicians and government officials. Now, more surprisingly, state support also increasingly appears to have been a factor in Sri Lanka's sole case of Islamist violence against other communities. The, the 2019 Easter bombings were Sri Lanka's deadliest terrorist attacks ever. Um, they were also the first ever attack on um, by Muslims against, uh, against other communities on religious grounds. The basic facts aren't disputed. A small band of Salafi Islamist men based in the Eastern province carried out coordinated suicide bombs at two Catholic churches, one evangelical church, and a series of hotels in Colombo. 270 people were killed and more than 500 were injured. However, what looked at first like a relatively straightforward case of Islamist political violence now appears to have been much more complicated. First, because evidence clearly indicates that the members of the national Tawid Jamaat who carried out the attacks were radicalized by the preceding years of state-sanctioned Buddhist nationalist violence and hate speech against Muslims, even as the attack our targets of their counterattacks were Christian, not Buddhist. Now, second, and most worrisome, increasing evidence has emerged that indicates significant state involvement in the attacks. This includes military intelligence of officials intervening to allow and possibly to actively, actively facilitate the attacks, as well as them actively preventing police investigations from exposing this support and from uncovering its alleged political motivation. In this interpretation of events, the objective was to generate enough fear of Islamist violence that Sinhala voters would support the candidacy of Kotabia Rajapaksa in the presidential election in, 20, in November 2019, running on a security and anti-Muslim agenda. This is exactly what happened. Now, all those, it's worth noting, all those allegedly who participated in the plan have denied any involvement. While there is an ongoing and very slow moving criminal trial of about two dozen Muslims accused of mostly peripheral involvement in the attacks, there's been no punitive or disciplinary action taken against senior officers and officials who were found guilty of negligence by both the Presidential Commission of Inquiry and the Parliamentary Select Committee. And there has been no credible independent investigation into allegations of military intelligence complicity in the attack, despite evidence emerging from senior former police officials and well-placed eyewitnesses. The international community, including those 14 governments, including the US government, whose citizens were among the 270 murdered in the attacks, should support the Catholic Church's call for an independent international investigation, or at least an investigation with significant enough international involvement to be credible. The need for stronger international support for justice for the Easter bombings is another reason for continued monitoring of Sri Lanka's human rights situation by the UN Human Rights Council even after the current council resolution expires this September. Human Rights Council and with it, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights remain essential tools for both justice and conflict prevention in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions uh, you might have and to an interesting conversation. Thank you. And thank you all for your comments. We will now actually turn to uh, questions. Um, I'll ask the first one and then I will uh, pass it to uh, Commissioner Wolf and then we'll uh, uh, follow up with our other commissioners. So uh, in addition to um, the US government perhaps uh, calling on and supporting a full investigation and uh, holding uh, accountable those involved in the uh, Easter bombing, what other ways can the US government support uh, freedom of religion or belief uh, in Sri Lanka? And I'll open that up to any of our guests who'd like to answer that question. Maybe I can jump in on that. Um, so the US has been, has led and has uh, supported um, uh, efforts at the UN Human Rights Council to um, for kind of a thorough investigation and some form of accountability for the events of January to May 2009. And I think those should be continued um, because, um, you know, as I mentioned in my comments, is, is, is all the kind of um, the testimonies here have said, this is really about a lack of accountability that is now entrenched and embedded in the state. Um, and any kind of sort of um, progress for Sri Lanka 
um, towards something else to sort of remove this threat, this ever hanging present threat of um, the possibility of violence being mobilized against any particular community. If that happens to be the politically sensible or salient thing to do, is there must be some form of accountability that will then trigger a, a process of reform. So I would say, I, yes, I would uh, say that the US government should support the um, Cardinal's calls for international involvement and support for a clear and transparent um, and um, trustworthy investigation into the appalling events of um, uh, Easter 2019 um, and and also maintain those efforts in relation to 2009 as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Sarah. So the ATB on the table, uh, it is also coming in the name of uh, the Muslim being so radicalized. Previously, the Sri Lankan government tried to bring in an addendum to PTA saying they want to do de-radicalization of these 300 odd people because they arrested without any basis or anything like that, right? Even some of the cases that we filed in Supreme Court, the Attorney General Department came and told us, if you withdraw the fundamental rights application, we let go these people in the magistrate court. So we had to barter irrespective of the torture, three of the 300 people died in, in prison. Um, so in that context, it is ex very, very important that US pay close attention to the counter-terror framework that Sri Lanka is working on. And it is also very interesting in the, in the last few, you know, at least few months, the Sri Lankan government has been passing laws with minimum number of parliamentarians. Now, recently, they passed a rehabilitation bureau bill with 17 members of parliament, right? So once it passed, passed, because Sri Lanka does not have post-judicial review. So we have that window of going to Supreme Court. And last time also, they brought in the ADB and then they withdrew. So they have been doing this, uh, bringing it and withdrawing it. And then uh, we fear that the Sri Lankan government, one fine day, slowly pass it with very simple majority. So the US has to pay close attention to ATB. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments on that question? Yes, Mr. Keenan. And you're on mute, Mr. Keenan. Mr. Keenan, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Classic mistake. Um, I don't want to make a specific recommendation, but I'm just thinking more generally in terms of how this U.S. government frames its interventions and engagement in Sri Lanka. I think two related things need to shift in order for the um, issues that all of the, of the panelists, including myself, have raised about you know uh, impunity, a lack of accountability, a politicization of, um, of religious tensions by many governments, current and past. In order to address those, I think the government, this U.S. government needs to um, take, I think they've trapped themselves a little bit uh, in their relationship with the current government by being so concerned with supporting economic stability in Sri Lanka, which is a worthy goal, um, that they've been very soft, much softer on this government for its um, human rights abuses and lack in you know, sort of um, uh, more authoritarian tendencies than they would have been on previous governments including those headed by one of the Roger Poxa brothers. And more generally, I think it's also a result of the, I think, overemphasis or uh, allowing the question of China and resisting sort of Chinese incursion and Chinese expansion of power to overdetermine US policy. And we see that, I think, in other parts of the world. But in Sri Lanka, again, it means um, that the US government is less actively um, critical of the Sri Lankan government for things that would have been critical of other governments, and also less actively, I think, encouraging other states in the United, in the European Union and other influential states uh, to raise these issues. So when I was recently in, in Colombo, a lot of people were telling me that, it, except for occasional tweets and occasional statements, no governments really are speaking out about these issues. Um, no Western governments or other influential governments who previously might have been. So I think there needs to be a more fundamental shift towards an openly challenging and critical um, position by the US government vis-a-vis -vis human rights abuses, including those related to religious um, freedom. Great, thank you. I'll now turn to uh, Commissioner Wolf to see if you have a question. Commissioner Wolf. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Davey. Uh, 
the the last speaker sort of covered it. One, let me thank all the witnesses. I I learned a lot and appreciate it very much. Uh, has there been a, a congressional delegation out in Sri Lanka lately? I don't know someone based in Sri Lanka should probably answer that more than I don't remember one. There have been various some um, senior State Department officials who have come, but I don't know of any um, uh, congressional dele delegations recently. Mr. Gabriel, you and Mike, and then we'll go to Mr. Hispola. And you somehow are still on mute. Uh, it says that you are not on mute, but we can't hear you. Mr. Gabriel, somehow, now there you go. I think we've got you now, go ahead. Oh dear, sorry about that. Uh, I okay. think just to mention that uh, based on what Alan said, we haven't had a congressional uh, uh, visit as such, a delegation visit, but we've had senior US state government uh, officials visit us and discuss religious freedom, including the use of last, uh, last year. Right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hispola. Yeah, I, I wanted to say the same thing. I don't think we've had a congressional uh, visit. Thanks. Commissioner Curry, do you have a, any follow-up <laughs> questions? I'm so sorry, I go just, ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner Wall. Excuse me, for, just as one. One, I think then I you ought to ask a congressional delegation uh, to come out, at least one or two, maybe a Republican and a Democrat, to come out and kind of see. We hear very little about Sri Lanka here back in the United States. Um, perhaps it's what's taking place in with regard to Russia and Ukraine and, and Gaza and different things, but the media really has not covered this. So I think it would be helpful to, to have a congressional delegation uh, by, by bipartisan to come and visit and see and experience. Uh, secondly, what, what countries uh, have the most impact. Uh, I have one other question after this. I'll ask them both together. What other countries have the most impact on what's taking place? If they were involved or speaking out, what what countries have an impact there in in uh, your country? Please, Mr. Hezbollah, and feel free any of you to open your mic and 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 and, and respond. But Mr. Hezbollah. Yeah, so um, India has obviously been a country of grave influence uh, to Sri Lanka. And uh, from a religious freedom perspective, uh, from a Muslim religious freedom perspective, it is it has been very worrying uh, because India under the BJP government has adopted a very hardline anti-Muslim sentiment. And um, so, so, so uh, we do see, uh, or we have reports uh, of the RSS operating in Sri Lanka and also taking up certain positions uh, with regard to certain issues publicly against Muslims. So that is one country that is uh, very influential in Sri Lanka. And uh, the economic crisis that the country is facing uh, has allowed India to walk in as a uh, economic uh, as as a helper, uh, and um, and also that has resulted in India also uh, being able to be politically uh, influential with certain geo in, in, in geographically sensitive locations being uh, allowed for Indian investments etc. So India is certainly an influential country. Uh, second, uh, China, or at least they're jostling for uh, the first place is China. China was influential in Sri Lanka, I think, when the Rajapaksas were in power. Uh, no, we don't see China being so visibly influential now. And then, of course, I think the third most influential, uh, I think the other Sri Lankan panelists can correct me, is the U.S. And we see the uh, U.S. also uh, quite visible in, in the level of uh, uh, to the extent to which they interact with the government on important issues uh, with the IMF, et cetera. Okay. And I think Ms. Sarora might have an answer to uh, Commissioner Wolf. Okay. Just very quickly, uh, yes, with the IMF walking in, uh, US is becoming a key player in Sri Lanka with regard to not only 
uh, various other issues, but also economy. So it's very important that because the governance issue is covered in the IMF, uh, the agreement, and there it has been extremely difficult for us to bring, bring in the FOB violation as well. So it will be helpful if, in, uh, you know, US to play that role. In addition to that, Japan has been the major donor to Sri Lanka. And Japan is now playing key role in the reconciliation process. They are now uh, driving factor of uh, the Truth Commission. That is one of the transitional justice processes. So maybe that's one place that we can also ask for some kind of influence on the FOB related issues. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank you, Commissioner Wolf. Uh, we'll turn to uh, Commissioner Curry. Uh, do you have any following questions? Yes. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Davey. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Wolf's observation that a congressional visit would be important. I say that because, speaking only for myself, I was in Sri Lanka about four or five days before I even could really understand all of the complexities. It is a very complex and beautiful, wonderful place uh, as, re as relates to this. Um, I have a couple of questions. I have several questions, but I, I know that others do as well. So I want to just jump in on a couple of them. There is this idea behind registrations that also relates to uh, some of the significant property issues um, that really is the, uh, it might be seen as like a weaponization of laws, rules, the opaqueness of the system. As regards to registering Christian churches, for example, what would seem to in this modern age be a very practical thing, which you would maybe post on a website and have a process you go through is not on a website. It's not clear. It's not required. But if you don't have it, you uh, can be shut down, arrested, harassed, etc. The the process is the persecution in some way, um, Mr. Gabriel. This is, in my view, um, a very significant issue because it, if you have people who are lack somewhat uh, some sophistication or are fearful of getting into the system, it really has a stifling effect. Um, how do you prioritize this issue of registration and, and the, the opaqueness of the, maybe intentional opaqueness of the system in Sri Lanka for churches and religious groups? Thank you, Commissioner Kari, for that question. I think for the Christian community in Sri Lanka, registration has been the number one concern when it comes to religious freedom. And uh, like you right, fully mentioned, uh, the opaqueness of the process in particular, as it stands right now, has been the main concern. We've had uh, many churches who've been uh, visited by the local authorities and asked to go and register with the lo local authority. But when they do go to the local authority, sometimes there is no proper process to do it. And they are sent back saying there is no system to register. But they continue to get harassed by the law enforcement or police more particularly. And then at times we also have intelligence officials who visit them from time and from time to time. So in such a, in such a situation, it, it, it's been very difficult for churches. And uh, particularly in the absence of a clear process, clear guidelines on how to go about it, uh, and the very opaqueness of the law being kind of weaponized against them. Uh, just to give you an example, we had a church... Uh, just a few months ago, who was uh, asked by the police to register. And when they went to the local authority, obviously they couldn't register. There was no process and they were sent back. And then the police continued to harass them. And uh, in fact, even told the neighbors that they should, they, sh they should record people who are coming to the church and uh, inform the police if there are people who are visiting the church who are not members of the family. So in such instances, many churches have been forced to now even, you know, meet online or stop services entirely. I think Mr. Sabala, you had a response as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, Muslim mosques uh, have been registering for a very long time, I think from the 1950s. Uh, so the problem is not really going in and registering. Of course, the Muslim mosques have been registering with the Muslim Religious and Cultural Affairs Department, and, and I'm sure similar similar uh, similar practices are there with uh, the the interreligious or the religious particular religious department registering the places of worship. 
but the but the new regulations what they really do is that you need to go and register with uh the buddha sasana ministry and the result of that is that it opens it for objections by other communities and that's where the problem is it's not a mere case of registering but it's also a fact that you open yourself up for other communities to object to your registration so uh, if you want to establish a church you might be rejected your registration might get rejected on the basis of an objection coming from the monk in the in the nearby temple thank you for that i mean if it's uh, my I'm relating to a story that I, you know where I spent about three and a half hours at a California Department of Motor Vehicles line being moved from one to the next. And if it was anywhere near as frustrating, I'm sure it's more than that. Then I, it's it needs to be resolved. The other question I have is for uh, Mr. Hezbollah. Um, that your story in particular, from what I re recall of it, is is particularly difficult for me because it seems as though you have been targeted because you're defending religious minorities, that there's this chilling effect by attacking the person. And, and I think a lot of people uh, understand the critical role of defense attorneys to uh, that there's a proverb that I, that I believe in which says that every story is believed but then there's another side and until you hear that other side you don't really know the story uh, so this is a critical part of a free society and yet they seem to be targeting you uh, is is your case do you see other patterns like this where they're targeting those that defend religious minorities or or, or people of a like category uh, as far as a lawyer being targeted for religious uh, freedom issues, I think I was the first. Uh, but lawyers have been targeted and have been victims for their political views uh, throughout the history of Sri Lanka. But why was I targeted? Why, why, why is it happening now? Is because, and I think... Um, uh, Mad am I pronouncing them Madara Madura Madura uh, highlighted is 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 that Easter Sunday was a project to establish a particular type of state, and that particular type of state had a particular religion and a belief and an ideology, and also uh, it selected. Muslims as the enemy of choice, the target of choice that's going to the other, the, the other that they chose were the Muslims. And so in order to fit into that narrative, they needed to also start targeting uh, Muslim minority rights advocates. And I think that's where my uh, arrest played a very, very important role. Uh, I was, I was, I was uh, the 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 evidence of the um, head of intelligence uh, to the presidential commission on the East Sunday attacks has now been made public. It was, it was, it was secret. It was confidential, not given to the public. But as a result of a parliamentary debate, it's public, and. Um, I was put for I was put forward as the as as the main mastermind of the East Sunday attacks. It's completely, but I'm not even been I'm not even been accused of it in a court of law. But this was the narrative. This was the story that they were trying to spin. So uh, so uh, a defense attorney being uh, or sort of a, a, a minority rights advocate or, or being targeted. For religious reasons, I think, I'm sure the other panelists, Shireen might be able to help me, but to my knowledge, I'm the first. And that's because of the current trend that we are taking uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, where there is less ethnicity and more religion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gabriel, you were going to respond? Yes, just uh, 
adding to what he just mentioned i think uh, the ncsl in particular some followers in 2017 uh, based because of the work that we did on documenting religious freedom violations had to face interrogation and some even had to leave the country because of the threats that they face at that point so there have been uh, previous incidents as well where lawyers who have at least in our case who have engaged on religious freedom cases of christians who have kind of spoken publicly about the number of incidents or the documentation of uh, religious freedom violations affecting churches and christians who have been targeted uh, by law enforcement thank you commissioner i'm sorry ms sarora so i can add one more to what he just talked about ramzi razik he's an online kind of a activist uh, online um, social media activist so the very buddhist monk that uh, he just talked about uh, when he said allah is the reason for the suicide bombing or, or people muslims blowing themselves up ramzi razik took on to the social media and talked about that we have to use counter these kind of hate speech using the social media but uh, he uh, framed it such certain way so the the uh, the sri lankan intelligence took him under the iccpr act uh, so he i mean activist of such nature is also like when you when there is hate mongering on the muslim community when they try to explain or defend and they are being arrested and put under iccpr uh mr kena yeah just to add another basic um sort of back, bit of background um going backwards of course there's a long history of of human rights activists some of whom may have been lawyers but um who were targeted for repression um arrest under the PTA our friend our mutual friend Ruki Fernando is a is a prime example but going back in history further than that but also i think all of these all these examples we're coming up with are further reason to be very worried about the online safety act which was passed earlier this year which is so expansive in its powers and so nebulous in what constitutes an untruth that the government can go after you for having said on social media that basically all of us including us here in this room are are potentially liable for you know for unfalse for false statements that from the government's perspective so i think everybody's quite worried that um we could be seeing with that at least there's a threat of a much more expansive attack on dissenters activists lawyers um religious people who speak up for any number of potential issues so i think there's reasons to be worried on that front thank you commissioner curry anything else no i know there are other questions but thank you so much a fa fascinating very important issue thank you uh, commissioner snet Thank you very much uh Davey and and I too would like to take a moment to to thank all of the witnesses this has just been um I mean in so many ways uh, eye opening and and uh, e even after the visit that uh Commissioner Curry and I and staff made to Sri Lanka last October I I continue to be surprised um uh, with some think uh, some of the things that you've said today have 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 done Uh, you know my question is a, a fairly broad question a number of of the witnesses have indicated that um a, a kind of religious nationalism associated with uh the Sinhalese Buddhist majority is in some ways um exacerbating uh the you know these challenges to um freedom of religion or belief and I, i wonder if if you if any of the witnesses might like to speak to that directly uh is 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 there a weaponization of religion that's occurring in 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 Sri Lanka and if so uh, why uh, what's what's the rationale behind it as you might might see it Mr. Ru, your mic's open. Feel free to comment. Uh, so, I mean, this has been happening for a very long time, but because of the ethnic conflict, uh, you know, like we didn't see how the religious hatred towards the minority community, minority religious community, was piling up. Uh, so, after the end of the war, the Sri Lankan government started very overtly. uh very quickly attacking uh the minority groups so th 
that's why the elections are very important, but Alan pointed out, because every time there is election, the single politician, in their effort or their attempt to appealing to single and nationalist vote, they they vilify the the religious minorities. Uh, so that this is this is, there is a growing trend trend, and also there is a growing trend of uh, almost I would say like Hindutva is already in in Sri Lanka, and then there is also lots of emotion running with the Muslim community as well. So with all those things. This is going to go on a very, very wrong direction. So this is very important that the, the, the country's leaders, uh, political leaders need to be very careful. Already uh, the, in the Tamil community, there is also, uh, because of the extreme Hindutva influence that the Tamil community, the Tamil community in the North and the East is now even looking at Christian Catholic uh, Hindus, right? So that is also divided now, right now. As we speak, even a political party is falling apart and an alliance is falling apart. So uh, so this is what we see it as uh, escalating. Apart from there is a systematic way of Buddhization of this country. And there is that fear that the Sri Lanka, the Theravada, the Buddhism, this is the only country and uh, you know the other the communities are trying to take over. Uh, and there is an allegation that the Muslims are multiplying and they are, we are going to take over the country and all those things. So the leaders come up with these things in order to gain vote. And they will also bring in people like Jnanasara. This, this Jnanasara Thera was a puppet of Gotabe Rajpaksha. So they, they create these puppets. And right now I'm sitting in Batikolo. There are two very uh, thug monks. Uh, who are trying to attack uh, communities. Uh, this Mailatta Madhav Madhavana, this case where the, the, the grace land was being taken, there is a Buddhist monk who is like, a, you know, uh, really fighting in the physically fighting and hitting people. So this is going to increase. I mean, this is unlike for a Buddhism. The Buddhism that you all know is different, but what we are practicing is totally different. And our, our political leaders are going to use this. So it is weaponized in order for political advantage. Thank you. Sure. Uh, let's go to Ms. Raza Ratna. Um, thank you. So I, I mean, I just want to add that it is, I would um, caution against saying that the religious element is new, right? Um, because it is, it, you know, I, I, my sort of reading on Sri Lanka is that it's a kind of religious nationalism, similar Buddhism, that's been the driving force of Sri Lankan politics since independence, really. Um, and so the Buddhism has always been there. Now, it, it was not that it was so submerged, it's necessarily submerged during the, the kind of the conflict, still ongoing conflict with, the, with effectively Tamil separatism. It's that, um, you know, the Tamil identity has been primarily cultural and linguistic rather than religious, but the Buddhism has always been there, right? So the kind of the justifications for, um, you know, um, needing to ethnically transform the North and East, uh, the justifications for, you know, colonization of the North and East, justification for the pogroms against Tamils, justification for the conflict, the violence of the conflict against Tamils always drew on Buddhism. Right. Um, it always drew on uh, Buddhist kind of mythologies of the Mahavamsa, you know, that the, the idea that the, the island as a whole was given to the Sinhalese people to preserve and foster Buddhism. And if there are Tamil settlements in the North and East, well, it's because they were kind of South Indian invaders who were coming from South India to take over the island. So I think it's it's and you have to kind of connect what's going on to the ways in which, you know, kind of the in academia we think of like conflict is productive productive not in a good way but it produces things so that can, conflict produced a certain type of very militarized very kind of ethnicized state of, of enormous military in term in per capita terms that is buddhist in its ethos um you know that has kind of you know there's there's kind of a limit to how much you can do to the Tamils there are very few left and you've taken everything they have so you turn to other people right and you need to find new victims um, so I, I would caution against seeing this as somehow distinct. I think the religion has, has always um, has always been there, um, and it's always been a kind of um, a um, it's 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 been central to the way in which Sri Lanka has developed since independence. Thank you, Ms. Gabriel. 
Yeah, I think just to add to what Shreen said in terms of the existential threats that the, minor, the majority community in particular experiences in Sri Lanka, apart from that, I think this entitlement complex, which is also there, which says that Sri Lanka is a singular Buddhist country, has been at the root of issues when it comes to ethno-religious tensions. And this has been something that has, in one sense, been constitutionally enshrined also since 1972. Sri Lanka's first autochthonous constitution granted Buddhism the first foremost place. And since then, state policy and practice has been majoritarian. And apart from this, we've also seen a sense of um, exceptionalism in the sense where Buddhist monks in particular have enjoyed a sense of impunity. And uh, it's only recently that we've been able to speak about these issues publicly. And there's been, in one sense, at least to some degree, a public discourse on religious freedom issues in the country. For example, in CSL has been documenting religious freedom violations for the past three decades. So it's been a problem that has been there and it's been very much entrenched and part of our social fabric. Is Bilal? And you're on mute, Mr. Hezbo. Sorry about that. So I echo the uh, comments made by the other panelists as well. And I agree that uh, uh, although we did not see it as a uh, religious conflict, a bit, the, the ethnic conflict was uh, a religious, or at least an effort on the part of a religious group for domination. Why it was not seen as an ethnic con a religious conflict was because the enemy was not framed on the basis of a religion, uh, but as an ethnic group. Uh, but in the 1990s, I think uh, Mike will agree that uh, that's the time, I think, when the evangelicals were being targeted uh, with uh, uh, with the early 2000, uh, the anti-conversion bill, etc. So 1990s was, I think, when the Christian minority, especially evangel evangelical churches, were being targeted with violence. But after the end of the war, uh, the Muslims uh, became the target. I think that was... Uh, a project, uh, a, a convenient project, project that will have a lot of support uh, from across the board, India and even the West would support an Islamophobia project, an anti-Muslim project, uh, and that would justify militarization, keeping draconian laws and the huge defense budgets. And also that, that, that was the selling point of the Rajapaksa government. Uh, Easter Sunday was supposed to be the sort of uh, the <clears throat> sort of the pedestal on which they were going to sort of springboard themselves out to another level of uh, another level. But unfortunately, the poor economic management on the part of Gota Rajapaksa sort of uh, drowned that project. But we see it again with uh, Gota releasing his latest book saying that uh, I was thrown out by Christians and Muslims and, and his... Uh, uh, assistant coming and saying the Muslims came to kill uh, Gotabe uh, when they came to his house. So uh, these, as to why is it a religious conflict, I think that's uh, that's what sells. And uh, Sri Lanka has has had this uh, 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 Sri Lanka Sri Lankan voters, uh, and as Shireen said, that this is the only country with Theravada Buddhism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These have been uh, themes that uh, that have bought votes and that have been have been uh, bases on which people have been able to win elections. So that's that's what we are seeing now. And best example is Gota's latest book, where he says Muslims uh, chased me out. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schneck. Any additional questions? Uh, no other additional questions. Uh, you know, let me close uh, again by thanking uh, all of the witnesses. This has just been uh, terrific. Uh, given the upcoming elections and based on your answer to my last question, uh, you know, I hope that the government uh, d does as much as possible to minimize uh, uh, interreligious tensions in the months ahead. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, with just the little bit of time we have left, let me do one question to Mr. Gabriel, and then we'll conclude for the day. Given your monitoring, are there any areas or districts where you see uh, any positive uh, steps being taken to protect the rights of religious minorities? I think that's a difficult question to answer in terms of uh, specific areas where there's been positive steps. Uh, unfortunately, I could answer on the contrary areas where there have 
there have been you know intensification of issues uh, but fortunately uh, it's it's difficult to pinpoint and say that in particular areas that there has been improvements when it comes to religious freedom but particularly i think it's important to highlight that in the northern east in particular there has been an intensification of tensions and maybe that's something that we didn't speak too much about also but we've seen the rise of hindu extremism which has been a cause of concern for christian churches uh, particularly in northern east while we talk about the hindu issue and the take over of uh, hindu places of worship uh, we've also seen the rise of uh, hindu extremist groups particularly groups like shiv sena uh, of shoots of the rss aided and abetted by their counterparts in india so i know that was not your question but uh, i had to mention that there understood yeah mr kina yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that um, and also kind of connect up with something that Shreen was saying, just to kind of draw a couple of things together. Um, what 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 Mike was just referring to, I think, suggests um, that almost in reaction, like sort of a dialectic between majoritarian um, identi identity politics from singular Buddhists, um, kind of has create has begun to create or um, feed into a counter reaction. We've seen to some degree that in among Muslims. I think this was a part a theme in in Shreen's, uh presentation that there is for a lot of other reasons, including global dynamics, a kind of um, developments of a almost like a Muslim nationalism or a Muslim identity politics of sort of um, sort of in part in defense against pressure that they got from Buddhists and more generally from the state. But you can also begin to see that in among among Hindus. Um, and I think what you now have the possibility for is not simply, as was just discussed, sort of a question of who of which group will be targeted by sort of the singular nationalist project with state backing, but also the potential of uh, of conflict between sort of the smaller groups, the, the minority uh, religious groups in their more kind of aggressive, defensive um, um, identity, i.e. Hindu attack, you know, sort of tensions between uh, Tamil Hindus and Tamil Christians, tensions between uh, um, sort of more nationalist or tough, uh, you know, Hindu groups and Muslims, potential alliances between Hindu groups and, 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 and Buddhist groups against both evangelical Christians and, and, um, and Muslims seen as a threat to what um, what the, what the Indian government likes to talk about sort of likes to discuss the civil civilizational connections between um, Buddhism and, and Hinduism and I think there's a lot of very worrisome elements that we could be kind of not going beyond the space uh, where you just have um, sort of the state attacking some kind of minority group of whichever seems to most politically useful to ones where there could be a multiplicity of potential lines of tension. Right. Thank you. All of that leads clearly to the fact that uh, we need to, uh, from you, SURF, continue our efforts in uh, working with you all to monitor and address issues of religious freedom or belief or the lack thereof uh, in Sri Lanka, particularly for religious minorities. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank you all again, uh, all of our witnesses for your crucial testimony. I also want to thank the audience for uh, joining us today. Uh, many thanks to fellow commissioners and staff uh, for uh, uh, both being present and uh, helping to launch uh, this hearing and the work that uh, everyone does every day on behalf of freedom of religion or belief around the world. So thank you, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>